how do you know if you are an addict? Well, I would define the word addiction as this. Hypnotist Elliot Wald. Elliot Wald. He is a professional, one of the world's best hypnosis experts. You find out the friends that use tell lies. Oh, of course. I don't know a single person with an addiction that doesn't tell a lie. We use uh, 117 tonnes of cocaine in the UK every single year. It doesn't matter where you are, 2023, you can get gear delivered faster than a pizza. So I had all this understanding of psychology, but yet I didn't tie the two together that I had an addiction because at that point, it was a social thing. It was a bit of a laugh. It wasn't causing a problem. Beneath every phobia, there is usually a logical explanation. But if you're not of the right mindset to find your trauma, how are you going to resolve it? If someone's listening right now out there who is stuck in a rut, is using, looking around, nowhere to turn to, what's the steps you would advise them to take? Oh, welcome to the show, mate. Good to be here, Dodge. Yep, very much looking forward to this one. Let's roll all the way back. Where did you grow up and how did you become a cocaine hypnotist? So I originally grew up in North London. Um, parents went out to move to South Africa when I was very young. Um, I have no idea why. I think it's something to do with work and making money. I think that was the thing. Uh, my dad was killed uh, when I was six years old. And uh, a week later, mum decided to come back to the United Kingdom. I went to a boarding school. I won a scholarship to go to boarding school for high achievers. Shipped off to a boarding school for three years and then came back home at nine years old. And my mum had remarried when I was nine. Uh, this was just to be your new father. Uh, in my head, I called him the pig. We could yeah. come to that later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so I kind of grew up through a very abusive, violent uh, upbringing. Um, off the chart, you know. So my, my food was put in a dog bowl. Had to eat out of a dog bowl. Kneeling on the floor, hands behind my back, water in a dog bowl. I had to drink out the dog bowl. Uh, caned until flesh came out my back, stood over, urinated on. So it's a quite an extreme. Hold on, hold on. Childhood. What, your stepdad did this to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he would lock me in a room um, every evening, padlock on the door, um, school holidays, get a tray of food, um, bucket, go to the toilet out every three days, have a shower go back into the room, lock back in the room. And mum didn't do anything. I, I think when I look back, I think that that was probably uh, one of the reasons that led me down to self-medicating and using later on in life. But no, mum didn't do anything. And, and it's interesting because a lot of people have asked me about this story and I've shared it to a number of people before. And they're like, well, did you grow up in poverty? And I was like, I grew up in a house that was worth two million pounds. Mm. You know, I'm 53 years old. We're going back to when I was nine years old. And who knows what that's worth today? Mm. So, so this man was extremely affluent, and whether my mother didn't do anything and stood by, just because um, she liked the money, I don't know. Um, my mom, I do know that my mum was brought up in a children's home, and she went through a, a lot of things herself. Maybe mm. that would have thought that that would have led you to be more protective of your child. But you know, you know, everybody carries their own journey mm. for whatever particular reason. And then um, I was 11, they had children, my half-brothers, they're twins. Um, I left home at 14 and a half, that was it. I, didn't, I couldn't deal with it anymore. Uh, run away from home. Um, I think that's where I first found the gym, to be mm. fair. For me, I, 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 that's stereotypical. I never want to get hurt again. I never want to get yeah. beaten. I'm going to be big and strong so no one ever hurts me again. And I, and I gravitated to real hardcore gyms. You know, by the time I'm 15, I'm 15 stone. By the time I'm 17, I'm 17 stone. Yeah. You know, by the time I'm 19, I'm 19 stone at like 5% body fat back in the day. And, and that's kind of how my journey uh, escalated uh, to the point where I studied psychology. I didn't go back to university until I was like 23 years old. Mm. So between the age of, of, let's say, 14 and a half, 15 and 21, you know, I grew up with an environment of people from the gym that I knew. And those people, you know, sort of the earth people, but they're like the doorman or yeah. they're a little bit dodgy or yeah. they're dealing and wheeling. Uh, and they were my family. They were the family that I kind of never had and always wanted. So, so that's what I gravitated to. I trained like an animal in the gym. Uh, and life was good. I found freedom. I found, I found you know, respect. I found loyalty. And um, I also found that the, the other side of it, I found that, that, you know, a few of my people, my friends were in prison for manslaughter, uh, one of them got killed. I made a decision in my early 20s that, you know, there was one or two things were going to happen. 
I was either going to end up doing something that I didn't want to do or I was end up going to have something done to me that I didn't want to get done. And I decided to move away, moved away completely, moved like 30 miles away, broke all my, all my, all my circle, if you like. But by this time, it escalated now to the point where, you know, friends of mine were going, oh, come out, come out. So I was going to a nightclub. It was like vip in because mm. everybody knew me. Everyone was older than me. Mm. You know, I gained a lot of respect. And, and all of a sudden, that's how that's how the, the drug started. They, you know, give me a ticket on a Friday night. It was Friday night. Oh, yeah, well, come in, come in, VIP you in. Give me a ticket of cocaine. Be up in there and started doing that. And then eventually, um, you can't keep taking. Mm. You end up buying. Uh, they weren't my suppliers, but you know, that's what happens. How old were you when you first had your first line? I suppose I was about 23, 24. Okay. That's when I first had my I first I just want line. to roll back a little bit. Sure. Here. I don't want to just, I want to jump... Your old man passed away at the age of six. Yep. How did he die? Uh, my dad was killed. He was murdered. So when I was six years old. And you were in South Africa? Yeah, yeah. I was in South Africa. I remember it very clearly. Um, I, don't know, I don't know. It's interesting because people, you know, there's a funny, funny story. Uh, how things happen in life. Uh, and, I, and I'll tell you this true story. So, so I've given you a background about how, how abusive it was. And therefore, I was pretty short fused for many, many years, you know. I was never the sort of person to cause trouble. That wasn't me. But if someone got out the car in a road rage, if they got out and they were coming towards my car, as far as I'm concerned, that's fair game. And yeah. there was just this red mist that just, I don't know. You know, you'd be out with friends and, and someone's girls get pinched their bum and, and I was always in the, in, the, in the middle of it. I didn't cause it, but I was almost looking for it. Yeah. Um, so when I moved away, I moved to a completely different area. One day I'm walking through the town centre, there's a guy walking towards me, he's looking, he's going, fuck off, fuck off. I'm thinking, who the fuck are you talking mm. to? Like, you know, And I felt inside of me, and then a person turned to me and went, no, 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 listen, you can't do that. And I was like, okay. A month later or so, I was back in this shopping centre, I see the same guy. He's walking through the shopping centre, and he's looking at somebody else, going, fuck off, fuck off. And I realised the guy's got Tourette's. And I suddenly went, oh my, mm. aren't I so pleased that I didn't do anything, yeah. right? So, so I think there are certain events that happen in your life. On the same day, a magazine that I used to get called Psychology Today that it was delivered. And, and I was flicking through this magazine on exactly the same day, right? And I get to this center spread. And on this center spread, there are twins. They're being interviewed. On the left-hand page, one of the twins is being interviewed, and he's on death row. I think he's killed three people. And the interviewer says, you know, what do you attribute to, to having killed three people? He said, I grew up with in a very abusive yeah. father who was always beating me and my twin who was beating me and my mother who was always committing petty crime who was an alcoholic who was very abusive how do you think i was going to grow up yeah. and then on the other side of the page was his twin and his twin works for the innocence project he's like a lawyer in america and what he does is he finds people who have dna unequivocally um innocent right there's no doubt no no speculation and they've already been incarcerated for 20 25 years and it can take him three to five years to still try and get these people out. And they said, what do you attribute to this being this great defender of the public people and helping people get out of prison when they were wrongly convicted? He said, I grew up with an abusive, alcoholic father who was always beating me and my twin, who was always beating me and my brother, who was very abusive, who was always committing petty crime, who was always in out of prison. How do you think I was going to grow up? And those two moments in my life on the same day had a huge impact. Yeah. I can't tell you how big an impact. Yeah. And I suddenly said to myself, listen, I can spend my life going, listen, this happened to me and this was bad and that was bad and I deserve this and I should get this. Or I can go, listen, I can use that. I can empathize and understand other people. I can help people who have been through similar or other situations that aren't similar where they've been affected in their life. And you've got to draw a line under it. And you've got to go, listen, I can go down that route or I can go down that route. It's your choice. Which mm. are you going to choose? And that's really how it impacted mm. me. How much anger have you carried around with you, with your stepdad being, as you say, the pig, over the years from the age of nine, like when you left at 14 and a half? So, so here's the interesting thing. It's only about, he died, let's say, about seven years ago. I, I left home. I never had anything to do with him or, or my mother, really. Uh, a few occasions I saw my mother over the years uh, when she'd phone and want my help because she had a problem with the builders and I should go around there and beat them mm. up, you know, still using and mm. using by some degree. So my brothers, their twins, are 11 years younger than me, uh, very smart. Uh, and here's the interesting thing. 
he was the ideal father, the perfect role model to them. You know, they couldn't have asked for a better upbringing, and I was pleased and I was happy with that. Um, one of the one of the one of the final points that made me leave home at fourteen harbors when he went to raise his hands to them, and I literally said to him that if you touch them, I will come back and kill you. Mm. I will come back and kill you. It's as simple as that. And I stayed in touch with my brothers for many many years, and sometimes I saw my mum in that situation. Uh, and this man was very wealthy, very successful, worked very hard. He was a chartered account, you know, like a professional mm. would never do that. Mm. Uh, and then when my brothers, uh, when he passed away about seven years ago, I was out in Spain and they phoned me uh, and, I, and I flew back to be with them. I even went to the man's funeral. I went to the man's wow. funeral and I never told a word. I never told okay. a single person. Well, I, d I told my friends and people close to me, but I never told my brothers what this man had done to me. So they're there telling me you know how wonderful and how great and how everything else is and then he was quite a photographer he uh, amateur so he likes to do his own photos and my brother turned to me and said oh, we, we're going to digitize all those thousands of photos and we're going to give you a cd and i was like i didn't want to tell them yeah. you know their dad's passed away i'm yeah. not going to put that on them and i was like no, i don't really need a cd i don't really need a dvd of all those photos <laughs> Anyway, a few weeks passed by, uh, and my brother comes to see me, and, and I'd seen my brothers maybe once every three months they'd come for a Sunday lunch all those years, okay, through their entire life. And uh, he, he comes, and he's very sheepish, and I'm like, what's the matter? He's like, well, I, I've done this DVD. I was like, oh, okay, but there's only two pictures of you on the thousands and thousands and thousands of photos. I was like, that's okay. You know, I know yeah, why, yeah. but they don't know why. Anyway, to cut a long story short, there was this, uh, he left them an inheritance of, of significant sum of money, uh, and they, I never saw them again after they got their inheritance, mm. and that was about five years ago. Mm. Never heard from them oh, again. Okay. So, so you know, I, I don't have any feelings about the way that I was brought up other than it wasn't right, but the one thing that I will take from it, Dodge, is this, uh, and this sounds very, very, you know, egotistical perhaps, but I think that I am a pretty fucking amazing father to my children Good for you, right and everything that i never had mm. i give to my children mm. i mean my time my love my energy i mean my, my my son's 24 years old he's six foot four and a half he's 25 stone he's a fucking unit right i swear <laughs> to you he's massive what's but his name Piers. Piers big shout out to your yeah, son Piers. Piers quality yeah <laughs> and, and i'm not kidding he's a unit right people see he's a yeah. unit he's got his big beard he looks like he looks like a uh, hagrid from yeah. uh, that's what people say to him <laughs> hagrid from a i don't know what's that film yeah, i don't I think of it yeah, yeah. but you know what i'm talking about yeah. anyway and he'll still come and sit on my lap i still give him a hug you know i i do what i can and i think the way i take it is everything i never had I want to have with my children mm. you know i want to be there for them my time my energy i take them out for lunch mm. all the time so i think the one thing that it taught me was everything i didn't have is everything i want to have and also i still want to get to the point as you're growing up from 14 you found the gym you're getting i've seen yep. photos of you in your yep. prime you were yep. a big lump yep. strong yep. lean you had the whole 24 lot. times yeah. yeah 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 you had every, you had you had the lot i've seen well, there must have been points as you were getting into your 20s and 22, 2014, 25, looking back again, I'm going to get you. I think, I think, I think there were times, I, I think my times were when somebody got out of the car, as I said, and they came towards me, that was him. That was him. Okay. That, that for me was venting that off. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's what it was. But, but I didn't see the point of getting this man because it was shit on my shoe. Yeah. Why would I waste my energy and yeah, my okay. time? Okay, I'm just intrigued. To yeah. Find. yeah, I get it. I get it. And the ages of when you first said your first line, how did that escalate for you to become an addict? Wow, so, well, uh, faster than you can imagine, <laughs> right? Um, so, so I started off from going to clubs and giving me tickets, and before I know it, I'm buying my own tickets. So, ticket is like a grand a, for a you, is it? A ticket could be anywhere. A bag. A bag, right? Okay. A bag, okay. a bag. So a bag, a bag could be anywhere between, in, in we're in 2023 now, a bag can be anywhere between a 0.4, a 0.5, a 0.6, a 0.8 to a full gram. So yeah. it can vary. Yeah. But I would say back in the day, a 0.4, I'd be out, have a bit of a fun time, do a 0.4, have a bit of a laugh. Never really been into alcohol. Yeah. Um, so, so one of the things about my dad is my dad was killed. The guy that killed my dad, he was drunk. Um, so that's kind of... I don't know whether it's an innate thing that I've never really been into yeah, alcohol. Okay. I'm not like I'm not like oh my god, you're the devil. You mm. drink alcohol. I'm not like that. You know, if I'm on holiday and I have I don't know 
I can't even remember when I had a last cider, but yeah. you know, maybe a glass of wine twice, three times yeah, yeah. a year. Someone made me a trifle. It's got sherry so you were it. dry sniffing? Yeah, dry all my life, dry sniffer. Absolutely. <laughs> wow. Full okay. on, hardcore dry sniffer. I haven't met many dry sniffers yeah, in my totally life. Yeah, totally dry sniff. Uh, I, think, I think for me... Because normally, people have two or three pints. Absolutely. They're on the phone, ordering whatever they do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, certainly, alcohol is certainly a gateway for the majority of users. Yep. Until Dodge, the funny thing is, until it isn't, you see, people start off with a very, very similar route. They start off that cocaine is a very social weekend aspect, right? Mm. And then eventually, this it was for me, it progressed. And then what happens is you start getting a bit more money in your bank, and then it becomes, well, let's tell you my story. So, so for me, it was a Friday, occasionally a Saturday, but usually a Friday. And then I ended up buying a point four That would last me out of my mates, come back, I had a good laugh, you know, so it seemed at the time. And then, you know, you start working, you start earning the money. I went back to university, I studied psychology. Um, I've studied multiple psychological therapies. I've studied hypnosis with Paul McKenna, uh, Dr. Richard Bandler, Dr. John Grinder. I've studied with multiple people. I've studied psychodynamic therapy, psychotherapy, psychology, linguistics, hypnosis, um, did a degree in psychology. So, so I did all that. So I had all this understanding of psychology but yet I didn't tie the two together that I had an addiction because at that point it was a social thing. It was a bit of a laugh. Yeah. It wasn't causing a problem. And then I started doing it on a, on a, I think I had a bit of bad news. We'll call it a Wednesday. It's like, oh, I just had some bad news. I'm going to pick one up. So, so now I'm doing it on a Wednesday and a Friday. And somewhere around this period, I start getting TV contracts. I was doing phobias back in the day because phobias are one of these things on TV where you see the problem and then I can work with them for two hours and see the solution and put in the phobic response. So we went to Trafalgar Square, had a woman had a fear of pigeons back there. You could have pigeons in Trafalgar Square. That's right. And she would go and feed the pigeons and she'd hug and cry and be like, yeah, cry, cry, because crying's fucking great TV, right? I'm thinking, yeah, please cry, please cry. <laughs> so she's crying with happiness and she's hugging me. And you're like, it's doing like 10 million views on BBC, yeah, yeah, yeah. then it was on ITV. Uh, and so now I'm, I'm getting paid good money, right? But now it's like a Tuesday and it's like, you know, I just got an extra bonus because they just paid me an extra few thousand pounds for, for the, the shot that just went so well. So now it's like a Tuesday and a Wednesday and a Friday. And then before you know it, it begins to escalate Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And for me at my peak, I was using six days a week to going from a 0.4 to a full gram, right? So you, you're your usage has escalated. So you were banging a point four on a Monday, point Monday, four Tuesday, Tuesday the, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, wow. Saturday. What roughly year are we talking? Decade? We're talking nineties here. Yeah, nineties. Okay, nineties. And you would have been mid twenties. Yeah, late twenties, okay. mid twenties. Okay. Yeah. Um, I then got TV contracts in BBC. I was going out to BBC to do my own TV show. I was on ITV this morning show. We get now to. I've written my first book by this point. Called. Uh, this book was called How to Stop Smoking and Transform Your Life Easily mm. on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Three books in now and about to write my fourth actually on, on addictions, substance addiction. So so I, I'm doing all these shows and all of a sudden, I've, it used to be tradition that, especially ITV This Morning Show where I was doing every single morning a different single phobia and we're talking about off the wall phobias, mm. right? We're not talking about, yes, your normal pigeons. Give, and, me, some, give me some phobias you were oh, doing. Oh, wow. Okay, I'll give you some strange <laughs> ones. A uh, lady had a phobia in mud cancelled her wedding because she couldn't walk on the field but she didn't want to have her wedding without being able to have photos of her on the field with her husband and family cancelled her wedding came on ITV this morning showing I got a phobia of mud I mean like you think <laughs> like a phobia of mud <laughs> ah but wait right. wait beneath every phobia there is usually a logical explanation so so I'm doing this case history I'm getting to understand this woman and she says to me um, I think I developed it because I used to like horse riding and I was riding in a paddock one day and it was raining extremely heavy, like lashing it down. And it was turning really muddy. And I slipped off the horse, but caught my foot. Foot was caught in the stirrup. So I'm dragging around, maybe for like 30 seconds, a minute. And all I can tell you is mud going in my mouth. And she can't breathe. She's drowning. Like the fear of drowning is immense. Yeah. The one thing you can do in life, you can think about what you need, right? And you might think, yeah, I really need this in my life. You really need that in life. But when you can't breathe and you can't get oxygen, yeah. you suddenly realize what is the most important thing yeah. in life, right? To survive and to live. Yeah. So really, it was quite a logical, you know, uh, transition that this one fear, this one phobic response had translated into mud. Mm. Instead of just being in the paddock with the rain and the mud, it translated into mud. And, and that's not an unusual thing. So I'm doing all these, these odd phobias on TV, you know, mud, um, 
lady with a, a fear of tomato soup. She would not walk down the Asda aisle in fear of tomato soup cans being in the aisle. This lady's still on my Facebook. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, mud, soup, uh, pigeons, needles. Oh, I had Dr. Dr. Chris Steele one day. He's like, he's not really into hypnosis. And hypnosis what was what my brand was. How would was. you explain hypnosis? How would I explain hypnosis? Okay, so we all experience types of hypnosis, but we give for different names from it. So let's say you're driving home on a familiar route and a song comes on. It reminds you of a holiday, an occasion, somewhere you've been in your life, some event. And you arrive at your destination without a conscious recall. You don't remember turning left, turning right, stopping at the roundabout. Your mind's in one place and your body's somewhere else, right? That is a form of hypnosis with a no-end response. It's not really where you're looking for. You know, when I was first introduced to hypnosis, uh, whew, I don't even remember what year, early 90s, uh, I met Paul McKenna, uh, who was on TV all the time yeah, doing his yeah. hypnosis show. Uh, and I remember meeting him at a function one evening. It was a charity event to raise money. We were just happened to be on the same table. Uh, and a, another celebrity turned around and said, you know, oh, this is Elliot, you know. He, he, he looks into people's minds. Because what I was doing then was psychology and body language. And I wasn't using hypnosis, I was using different forms of psychology. I was reading people, whether people were holding, hold, withholding information, uh, interrogation techniques, all those things that I was doing back then. He said, what about hypnosis? I said, I don't really believe in all that bullshit. And he started laughing. I said, what are you, what are you laughing? Yeah. He goes, you know, people don't really say that. I said, listen, I'm just a, what you see with me is what you get. I'm a straight talker, sad as it is, that's my reputation. He said, come sit in the back of the room, see what you think. Came to a corporate event, sat in the back of the room, thought this was pretty damn interesting. It wasn't anything like I thought it was. It was about influencing people. You know, think about this concept for a moment, just to go off tangent. You go to the supermarket. What do you think are the two most common items purchased in the supermarket? Fruit and veg. Not bad. Bread and milk, right? Yeah. Now, you will never find bread and milk in a supermarket. Not talking about a corner shop. You will never find bread and milk near the entrance. It's either halfway through the mm. store or at the end of the oh, yeah. store. Why do you think that is? So when you start buying everything else. Exactly, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So hang yeah. on a minute. They want you to purchase things you didn't come in the store to intentionally purchase. Mm. And most of the time, we come out with things we didn't intentionally mm. purpose. So they're influencing you. They're influencing you to make a purchase that you didn't intend to do. That's a type of hypnosis. We buy a certain brand of car. Why? because it's a perception of values that it is according to us. Why does it have this perception of values? Because we have been influenced that that car means that particular influence yeah. for you, right? You know, you buy a certain brand of clothing. Why? Because you're influenced that it has a certain value to it. So when you think about hypnosis, hypnosis is about things subliminally affecting you. Yeah. You know, think about a pair of trainers that you see on the side of a bus. You don't suddenly run out and go, oh, I need to go and buy the latest Nike and Adidas, right? But when you're in the shop and you come to make the purchase, you're more likely to make that yeah. purchase based on how you have been subliminally affected. I mean, listen, I, I had a, a client in the other day and what she does for a living, she's an influencer. She has like a quarter of a million followers. And she says to me, hell, she says, I, I, John Lewis can send me a lamp, right? And I'll, and I'll do a video about this lamp in two minutes. And she gets paid a, a nice mm. sum of money, right? And all these people are buying these lamps. Why? Because we're being influenced. We're being influenced every single day of our life. And that's a form of hypnosis. That's yeah. what it is. So, so those are the hypnosis we experience every day. The difference is here, we're using a strategy to get where we want mm. without realizing. Listen, we're computers, right? Let's just use this analogy. We're computers. And we're born with a certain amount of hardware, okay? And it's very limited, to mm. be fair. Uh, and I'll tell you how the whole addiction process works in terms of from a psychological standpoint, because it ties in well. So our brain is split into two halves. Conscious, everything we're aware of right now. And then we have our unconscious or subconscious, I prefer the word unconscious, everything that goes on beneath your awareness. So Freud used a great analogy. He used a pyramid. And he said, if you look at the pyramid in the iceberg, and he said, if you look at an iceberg in the ocean, you have sea level, above sea level, the tip of the iceberg, but you can see that you're conscious, very small. Beneath sea level, you're unconscious, the vast part of the iceberg. And so you can think about logically that your conscious mind, if it's very small, can only be aware of so much at any one time. But your unconscious stores everything. Mm. Everything you've ever done is stored there. So you're born with a limited ability. You know how to sleep, you know how to eat, and you know how to go to the toilet, and you know, it's basically what you know, right? Mm. More or less. Now the conscious mind has one main role, and its role is to learn everything you teach it. So you learn to walk, and once you learn to walk, it's stored here in the unconscious, so you don't forget the very process you learn to do. 
okay? You learn to talk, you learn to swim, you learn to drive, you learn to do your shoelace up. Every single thing you do now, you learn through repetition. All learnings learn through repetition. Mm. You learn and you repeat the learning. And for some people, it's quicker. And for some people, it's longer. But eventually, you learn the same process. Mm. And it goes in your unconscious mind and it's stored. Freeing up your conscious mind to think about anything else. Think about driving. You learn clutch, mirror, indicator, accelerator. Mm. And once you've done it sufficiently, you get what's called conscious competence. You're good at doing that thing, that strategy. And then it goes to your unconscious. And now you don't have to think about driving. You think about other things. Mm. That's really how it works. So when you think about everything you do in your life, right, everything you do in life, every decision you make, everything you want to avoid, everything you like to do, it comes from your unconscious. Now, your unconscious is formed from everything you learn, right, your upbringing, so how your upbringing affects you, whether you had a bad upbringing, a good upbringing, and how you choose to use mm. your upbringing, your values, what's important to you at that time. So maybe before you had children, that was an important value. You lived your life slightly differently. Your beliefs, what you to believe to be true. And there are two types of surface belief. That's called a factual belief. The world's round. Someone tries to disprove it, comes up with the same solution. Yes, the world's round, yeah. right? It's a factual belief. Then you have a personal belief. That's a personal belief that you might find to be true that somebody else may or may not also believe to be true. So how you bring up children or a faith, a religion, that might be true to certain people, maybe not true to other people. And then you have a substructure of beliefs which are empowering things that you know you can do and disempowering where you doubt yourself. So then you have your values, your beliefs, and then you have your, your experiences. That's everything you've ever done in your entire life. So. Imagine, Dodge, that you didn't like red apples. And I said to you, Dodge, have a red apple. And you went, oh, I don't like red apples. And I went, why don't you like red apples? And you would say to me, because I had one yesterday, last week, last month, a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. And you're judging your experience of whether you like that apple based on your past experiences. That's how it must be. How else do you know what type of music you like, what type of movies you like, what type of food you like, what type of drinks you like? You know through your past experiences. That's affecting your decisions today and tomorrow and in the future mm -hmm. based on your past and everything else in your unconscious. And in the blink of an eye, you now make decisions to do things based on your past, mm -hmm. not based on today. So when you think about your brain as a computer, the analogy I gave you, you're born with certain uh, hardware, certain hardware that your brain runs. And then over the years, all this information that I've just talked about becomes your software. Now, if your go-to software is something you taught yourself like, I need to get on it on a Friday or when I have a bit of stress or when I have a bit of an argument or when I'm celebrating. All of these emotional triggers, right, suddenly become unconscious. Now you've got faulty software and your faulty software is running around inside of your head without realizing how you created that software. So hypnosis and psychology and all the things that I, I use in helping a client get from where they are to where they want to be in terms of their addiction is about changing their software, changing their emotional responses. Because if you change how you think and you feel, you don't respond in the same way. Because right now, it's like this. You get to your car, the travel lights turn from red to amber to green. You don't think, oh, it's green, I should drive. You're an automation. Mm -hmm. In the same way, that person is phoning their dealer, sending a text. Hello, mate, can I keep me in 20 minutes? And the society we live in, this is my big saying, you can get gear delivered faster than a pizza. Yeah. It don't matter where you are, 2023, I'll phone a pizza, I'll phone five dealers, the five dealers will be there before the pizza. Yeah. That's the society we live in. Yeah. yeah. Take me back to your addiction. From your 20s, starting using yep. in the 90s, and 90s back then it was seen as kind of the yuppie drug where you had to have a load of money <laughs> to be getting cocaine back then, and it wasn't as as much, it wasn't as prevalent as now in, in the UK. Tell me your road of addiction till you hit rock bottom. Okay. Oh, so, so rock bottom's an interesting word because yeah. it's a terminology a lot of people use, right? Now, so, so therefore people can perceive rock bottom as having spent all their money, getting everything on tick, not paying their bills. You know, I, I, I'd done all that early in my life before yeah. addiction. You know, yeah. I remember leaving home at 15, 14 and a half actually, 15 years old. I've, I've surfed on people's sofas. I've lived on the streets. Yeah. I've gone without, you know, I, I, I've gone three, four, five days without food. I've stolen from a corner shop. Mm. Uh, so I did all that before my addiction in terms of that level of, of getting to the very bottom of my life. Uh, it's a true story, right? I remember 
being 15 and a half years old, I went to the corner shop and I stole a loaf of bread and a block of cheese. Now, it's against my values. Uh, and I remember going back uh, and saying, staying at a friend's sofa, uh, a guy who, he's, he's, a, he's still on my Facebook today and I still give him a lot of credit for what he did for me. Anyway, and uh, he asked me if I wanted these books and I said, you not want them? He said, no. So I went door to door selling these books. Uh, and I got together five pound. I went back to the corner store and I said to the guy in the corner shop, I said, listen, I'm really sorry, but two days ago I stole a loaf of bread and a block of cheese. And the guy looks at me. He said, how old are you? I said, I'm 15. He said, why haven't you eaten? I said, listen, I told him I'd run away from home and it wasn't worth going back and I wasn't going home. And I've got this fiver together. And he said, listen, he said, most people are 15 who still sign from the corner shop still some sweets, mm. some chocolate, some crisps. You know, why are we just, so I told him. And I said, here's the five pound. And he looks at me. This is the first bit of human kindness that I'd ever experienced in my life. Like really, you know, really touching. And he said, come to my corner shop every Friday. Every Friday I'd go to this corner shop. He'd give me a box with some bread, some cheese, some eggs, some biscuits, you know. And he did that for years, mm. years. You know, I'm talking about maybe 18 years old. He did that till I was 18 years old. Funny enough, when I got my first book deal in 2008, uh, which was a, a nice uh, agreement sum, you know, what they call it when you first get mm. paid. Uh, I took a sum of that money and I went back to that shop and I bought him and his wife a holiday and something I'll never forget. Uh, I th I'm a great believer in paying Absolutely. forward in life. You know, Good for you. Things do things for you because you've mm. got to give back. I'm mm. a great believer in giving back. Mm. What was the question? I can't, I can't think. I'm enjoying this so much. I can't remember <laughs> what the question was. I want to, I want to know your journey of addiction, okay. how it so, sped up. You yeah. were lifting weights. Were you at a point lifting when you were lifting weights? Did you did you get into roids at that time? Oh, yeah, for sure. You did. Listen, I mean, I've competed at Southeast of England Championships, Northeast of England Championships, British finals. You know, I think when you get to like 18 and a half, 19 stone and you're at like 5, 6, 7% body fat, yeah. I, I don't, you know, maybe you are some special, unique, genetic, you know, freak, yeah. but I wasn't. And yeah, you've got to bang in the gear. You know, there's no question in my mind. I, I used gear for many, many years. What, what uh, type of roids? Because uh, back in the day, there wasn't, there wasn't Google so, to ask what so, roids. So, it was so like your back mate. in the day, it'd be like testosterone, cypionate, and, you know, Winstrel, and Decca, and, you know, and, and here's my problem. Here's my problem in life. My problem is I have an all or nothing mentality. I do <laughs> not nothing but, say. I don't do anything but halves, right? Yeah. When I was using gear, when I was on a coke back in the day, like you wrap me up a little spider, I'm like, what you giving me that for, right? I'm like, I'm all in. I'm like, you know, that's me. I'm serious, right? So, so it's the same thing when I'm training. I remember very early within a year of within a year of training, I was squatting 320 kilos, like absolutely. I could still. I'm 53 years old. I could go in the gym now. Uh, and I challenge anybody if they don't believe me, I can go in and squat 250 quite easily yeah. all day long. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll squat, I'll, I'll leg press like 12, 13, 14 plates aside. Yeah. Aside? Uh, yeah. yeah, aside, yeah. yeah. So, you know, so I've always been that all or nothing mentality. Um, <laughs> so when it came to gear, when it came to roids, you know, I was the same thing. I'd be banging in 10 mil a week, you know, I don't care. 10 mil. Yeah, 10 mil. But But here's the interesting thing. I've also got this point where, I don't care what happens to me because everything I've been through at yeah, this point, okay. I've got nothing in my life. Yeah. And I remember, if I go back now, and I remember, I'll tell you a story about my 21st birthday, just remind me, but um, I remember very clearly thinking to myself, and this is really crazy, right? I remember thinking to myself, listen, if I win like the biggest bodybuilding show, the Olympia, if I get to this point and I die five years later, I'm happy, what do I care? And that was my mm. mindset, you know, it really was. You look back now at 53 and you think, wow, well, I would have been dead by 26, mm. but that's how it was for me. Nothing else mattered. I didn't have anything in my life. Who, where, where go? who was guiding you at that time? Because you were taking roids in the 90s, right? Yeah. And it's always like, my mate Dave says, that's really good. Give it a go. There was okay. no there was no guidance anywhere. So, who, so, who, who was serving up to you? To so, say, yeah. so, uh, so I've got to be very careful what I say, because some of these people are still pro bodybuilders today. But I was incredibly fortunate. Because at the age of 17, I walked in a gym, and this wasn't the pro bodybuilder, but I walked into a gym with a guy called Albert Beckles, who was a professional Olympia Universe contender who used to come over to the UK. He was training there. Um, I, I met you know many, many, many pro bodybuilders just through my network, and therefore... I got a lot of good advice, you know, maybe not good advice, but good advice. Yeah. In other words, like maybe you shouldn't be doing that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, I would just be banging shit every single week. Like, you know, I, I went over to, so when I'm 20 years old, right, I got a thousand pounds and I'm thinking to myself, you know what I want to do? 
I want to be at the Mecca of bodybuilding. So where do bodybuilders train? They train at Gold's Gym yeah. in California. Mm. I got myself a one-way ticket to Los Angeles. I've trained in California for two and a half years, right? Uh, and I didn't know a single person with a thousand pounds. I ended up meeting all the pros, training at Gold's Gym every single day, getting massive. You know, that's that's all I cared about. That was it. What did roids make you feel like? Listen, if I look back, right, first of all, let's deal with the misconception of roids mm. for some people. Because there is a misconception. There's a lot of general public who, who don't train to that intensity level and think, oh, I could just whack in a jab now and tomorrow morning I yeah. wake up and I'm a fucking freak. Yeah. Right? That's not true, yeah. right? You've got to have a certain quantity, you know, you've got to have a certain level of genetics. You've got to eat right. Listen, I used to wake up at 3 a.m., set my alarm, drink a protein drink, go back to sleep. I would train twice a day, like serious, intense. The people I trained with were serious, hardcore trainers. You've got to put all of that into place, right? That's the first thing you'll do. And there's no question in my mind that does it make you more short-fused? Oh, it definitely makes mm. you more short-fused. But if you can begin to understand that and you can begin to see that, you may not necessarily end up with this massive rage that a lot of people do. Mm. But but I think I think the steroids for me were the with with the cataclysmic start of what was to become with my all or nothing mentality. When I started getting into using cocaine, mixed with steroids, you know, your test That's dangerous, mate. Cocaine, oh. a lot of cocaine and a lot of roids. Yeah. Were you getting into tear ups? I was getting into tear ups where it was being asked for. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't That's a polite way of putting it. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't the one like going out on the door. You know, I wasn't the one walking through a bar. You know, like like yeah. you got carpet rolls under each yeah. arm, going, "Yeah, who's having it?" I wasn't yeah. like that, right? If I was with some friends and and you know, I used to go out with a group of eight to ten people, and all the people in my unit were training, all yeah. trained, and they're all like. 17 to 19, 21 stone, right? So you can imagine that in itself is... is, is um, It's intimidating for anyone. It's intimidating, it? yeah, course, yeah. right? Yeah. And then, of course, if it kicks off, what am I going to do? I'm going to run out the door. I'm mm. going to be there. I'm going to batter someone. Mm. That's what you do. Mm. But it was, I realized later on it wasn't a life that I wanted because I could see where it takes you. I could see where yeah. it goes. And then you couple that with your test flying high, your sex drive is out the window, you, you, you're short fuse, and then you couple that with using gear and you, you're on coke. It's a recipe for disaster because, you know, you want to be shagging everything that yeah. moves. Um, I've done that. You know, I slept my way around America. Uh, I'm not, not proud of it, and it's not, I'm pretty proud of it, actually. <laughs> no, but it's listen, in the bank. <laughs> listen, you know, you've got to get... Uh, there's an expression in yeah. life that my best friend said to me, and they said this, and something's always stayed with me. They said, you have to go through what you don't want in life to understand what you do want. I think that's a great mm. quote because it's only through the experiences of what you've done do you develop and learn. Not everybody learns, mm. but you, do you develop and learn and go, yeah, I don't want that, I don't want that, I don't want that, I do want this, I do want yeah. this. Uh, and that's how life yeah. you know, develops for me if you learn from your life. What's the feeling like when you're using roids, using roids, you get bigger and stronger and stronger, and then you come off the roids? I don't know, I never came off. Have you <laughs> What, even up to today? Seri oh, no, 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 no. Okay, but there must have so, been a point when you come off, you're like, hold on a minute, I'm dropping, I'm losing weight, I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting less and less, and muscle mass isn't as strong and as big as it was. I think I think there were a few things that happened. In Para that. must have kicked in with that. Yeah, um, I don't know. So for me, it wasn't necessarily a choice. Mm. So um, I first got a massive injury uh, when I was 22. It was nothing to do with training. It was a car accident. The car went into the back of me. Uh, and damaged one of my vertebrates and I had my, my neck cut open and I had a fusion at C1 to C2. Three months later, I was still training, still training like an animal, it didn't stop me. But then I would say in my 40s, I woke up one morning and I was completely paralyzed from the neck down, just out of the blue. And uh, it was a pretty scary thing. I've got a video I can share on it. When you say completely paralyzed yep. from the neck down, are you saying you can't get out of bed, you can't walk, you can't, can't stand up? Can't move. Completely. Can't move. I could I could wiggle my toes. From what? From going to bed? Went to the gym. Fine. Went to the gym in the evening. Felt absolutely fine. I'm in my forties at this point. Went to the gym, absolutely fine. I'm still rocking seventeen and a half stone at five percent, seven percent body fat, ten mm. percent body fat max. So I'm still looking in your forties. In my forties. Wow. Still pretty looking pretty mm. looking good. And I go to sleep, I train shoulders the night before, I wake up in the morning, and I, could, I was trying to move my toes, and they would be moving like, like, like hardly at all. It was like, whoa, what, what's happened? Uh, got an ambulance phone, the ambulance took me off, they had to put me in a stretcher, couldn't move, took me to the hospital, they had no clue what was going on, not a clue. 
they put me in MRI and they suddenly realized that this, this plastic cage in my neck that had been there for 20 or 30 odd years had uh, caused a problem that had eroded the other discs mm. in my neck and they had literally collapsed. So they blue lighted me to Addenbrooke's in uh, Cambridge. They did emergency surgery. They cut my neck open across here. They cut my neck all the way back down the back. And to cut a long story short, they fused C1, C2 had been fused, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, C8. So every single disc in my neck is fused, which is why I can't even turn yeah. my neck that far. You can see, yeah. like, if you see here, there's scars across oh, yeah. there, and, yeah, and, yeah, there yeah, yeah, yeah. and then all the way down the back. Um, and I have no feeling in anywhere here. So I can't feel these three fingers. Unless I do that, I can feel that, yeah. but I can't feel that. Yeah. Really strange, right? So that in itself was a bit of a... Uh, Listen, I, I can't train. That's the biggest wake up call you Yeah, it was a it? huge wake up yeah. call. And it meant I couldn't be out there, you know, benching, you know, 250, 260 mm. key because it just my hand was behind. So, in that respect, and I also thought to myself, I'm in my 40s now. So, there's no point in banging that much gear. Um, so, this is what, 15 years of banging gear? Yeah. Fifth, so, I would say I first started, the first time I put a needle in myself, I was about 16, 15 and a half, 16. All the way through till I was 40. Bloody hell. So did I take time off? 24 yeah, when, years. When I was on a flight. <laughs> uh, but like, if I could get it, I was, was going to do it. It's as simple as that. And when did you, so you started cocaine mid-20s. When did you stop doing cocaine? So 2008. 2008, I stopped using. How old were you, roughly? Uh, well, I'm 53 now. We're in 2023. Again, around your early 40s. Yeah, about, about, the, about the same, very same similar, time. similar okay. kind of time. And was there a reason why you wanted to stop or had to stop? So here's the biggest reason, the biggest wake-up call for, for, for using the packet, cocaine addiction. Mm. I like to call it the packet because certain social media is really a bit hot on it. But <laughs> anyway, right? So I'm on ITV this morning show. At this time, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about eight different TV shows. Um, writing my second book, everything's going great. And there used to be this this thing that I used to come home because you finish very early when you're doing this morning show. I used to come home and it would be we recorded it, and I'd sit there with my kids and we'd we'd watch the TV, and my partner, and, and we'd watch it all together. And I'm looking at it and I go, I look fucking off my face. I look wired. Nobody else has noticed this. Yeah. Nobody else can see this because. I was a very, very uh, functional user, right? Mm -hmm. You know, people have this mindset, oh, you use a gram a day, you must be on some park bench sipping like cider. Yeah. No, I was a functional user. You wouldn't know, you'd look at me, you wouldn't have a clue. Yeah. Because, because, and that's what I said about, it's very common for people who start with an alcohol gateway to end up being dry sniffers. Because when you get to the point of using two, three, four plus times a week, you can't sit there drinking alcohol mm -hmm. in a meeting. You can't be sitting here, yeah. you know, Drinking alcohol and having a, an interview, you can't yeah. be sitting somewhere drinking alcohol if you're sitting on the board. And my clients range from road sweepers to CEOs to surgeons to lawyers. To, you know, we're in a society mm. now where, as you said, it's prevalent. It's mm. everywhere, mm. everywhere, right? Absolutely everywhere. So, so yeah. I lost my thread. Where was I, right? Uh, oh, were, so, you, so we, so were you on TV? Were you going to the box before having a corner and then going out and doing your... Well, when you leave at 5 o'clock in the morning and you finished at 2 a.m., you've got to have something to wake you up, right? So absolutely, I'd do a line, come back on TV, and I'm on the ball. My, my job, I'm very... No other, there's no one, no one in the UK ever, to this day who does phobias live. They've done pre-recorded, but okay. nobody ever has done this live. And the TV show, they love it because you know what? Whether I succeed or whether I'm not successful, they don't care. It's good TV. It's entertainment. Yeah. That's what they want. Because it's purely live. Purely yeah. live. Yeah, so my neck it. is on the block every single day. That's a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure because that's my livelihood. That's my reputation. And I've got to tell you, there wasn't a single time that I didn't achieve the result. Every single time I got the person over the phobia. Every single day. So every single day of the week, you've got that pressure on you. So you're going to bed thinking, oh my God, you know, tomorrow, you know, what happens if? Well, there's always, you know, there's always yeah. what if, you know, what happens if something comes out that I have, and I have no, no knowledge beforehand of what this client's going to, going to present to me. So you're completely freestyling it. Completely, Quality. a thousand percent. Yeah, mate. Snakes, spiders, ear piercing. Oh, Dr. Chris Steele is what I was going to tell you earlier. So I did this one with a phobia of needles, right? And we pull out the, so she, we pull out this needle, and I'm expecting a syringe about this big. It's a normal syringe. Listen, I know I've put enough syringes in me, right? He pulls out the syringe. I don't know, maybe you're a horse or something would use. I'm thinking, you wanker. You're doing this yeah, yeah, on purpose. Right? And she was like, yeah, that's no problem. And then uh, 
Philip Schofield. Well, I think his name is a bit dark at the moment. But anyway, did he, you work with Philip Schofield? Yeah, Philip Schofield. Yeah. Did anyway, he have a line with you? Uh, he didn't have a line with me, but anybody who has his hand stuck up, but go for you should you should think twice later on in life, right? And I always kept my myself to the back of the wall. Uh, no, I didn't know about that. So I uh, worked with Philip for, for many, many years and Eamon Holmes and all those, yeah. Good bloke, Philip. Uh, listen, I, he was always a laugh um, on set. I didn't know him off set. I never socialised with him. No, that's not my way. Um, yeah, I mean, listen. Well, I can't comment on that. <laughs> Gordon Lee Gofield. I think that says it all, right? That says it all. So, 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 yeah, you, and you, you turn up, so, so you'd be doing a line. So I'm back home with my kids, and I'm watching a pre-recorded of earlier in the day, and I look wide, and I'm thinking, fuck, my world could, could come tumbling mm. down. Can you imagine? There's this guy with my brand at the time was a hypnosis expert, which he still is, but I use lots of different psychologies, right? A lot of people misunderstand. They're like, I went to this hypnotherapist, it didn't work. Yeah, well, what about psychodynamic therapy? What about linguistic therapy? What about understanding how words mm. affect your brain? I use all of that. It's very different, right? And I think, can you imagine how the newspapers would just pick up on that and would crush me? Yeah. And this was this, this, this boom, and I went home and I went, and, and I, I'm fortunate that my gift in life is that I'm able to read things uh, like a theory book, and I'm able to actually almost see that in print. So I read every single book on addictions, I read every single research paper, and I went, I'm gonna start applying this on myself. And I did, and I developed my own strategy that was very different to rehab, different to CA, different to all the other things out there, which um, to me, the problem with... The, let's just so was that your light bulb moment? When you're that like, was my right, light bulb. I my... now need to transfer this into a skill. I've got all the skills. Absolutely. I don't want to transfer this into cocaine. Absolutely what okay. I did. And then, and, then, and then it gravitated so fast and so quickly that I stopped. Friends of mine who were serving up, they stopped. Friends of theirs were stopping. Uh, Why, because you were helping them? Yeah, because I was helping them, literally. I I, I, people said to me, how, did, how, the, how the fuck did you do that? I was Pablo Escobar. Like, how did Escobar stop using his own when he's got a mountain, right? You know, and that's what happened. Were you serving up? I've never served You've up. You've never served I've up? I've never okay. served up. Okay, but how never. does it go for the normal bod on the street? You know when it goes, oh, I'll have a gram. All of a sudden, he's going, I'll have that free gram. I can serve up, buy free off you and serve them up to my two so, mates. So, so that's listen, the sort of route most... I think there are two. There are, there are different ways of looking at this. I think, first of all, the person who has an addiction can often end up thinking, well, if I buy an ounce at like 1,100, 1,200 pounds and I chop that up, I can double my money. I can get my usage for free. I think there's one way of looking at it, right? There's a second way of looking at it is, those some people have ticked their dealers so much that the dealer goes, right, you need to run around for me. So there's, there's different ways of getting into it. Or just plainly you like money and you just want to serve up boxes and kilos and serve up kilos and make lots of money and you're prepared to do the time. You know, I think that's the way it works. But for me, I, I didn't have that, that I, I never served up. I'm not, listen, I have clients from all walks of life. I have clients from huge, huge dealers. Like we're talking like major, major players, right? Right through to your- Who are still ones, coming to you. Who still come to me, who do not want to touch yeah. what they get their hands on or what they don't get their hands on, but what they're given is, as a free or, or it's passed down. They don't want to touch it. And I have a very, you know, I think, I think here's, where, here's where I'm fortunate. We talk about people's upbringing as being negative. So I think that my upbringing for what I do was quite a positive because I learned from the streets. I learned what respect was. I learned how to keep my mouth shut. I learned when to look, not to look. And I learned that from mostly from hardcore gyms that were very, very That's young course, age. We all learned that. Right. No grassing. No discipline. grassing. Discipline. Yep. You know, I know when to not listen. I know when not to look. I know yep. when to keep my mouth shut. Yep. You know, I've got friends of mine that are serving 25 years for murder. I've got friends of mine serving 15 years for drugs. And I've got friends of mine that sit in chambers in law, yeah. you know. So I have friends, a complete cross-section, right? Yeah. I don't judge, I don't give a flying fuck what somebody does. Isn't that nice, though? Yeah. To have friends on a complete cross-section yeah. of everyone. Yeah, really. And relate to everyone, yeah, keep I, everyone on the same level. Exactly. Same. Nice. Because I don't give a flying fuck yeah. what you do. If somebody comes to me yeah. because they want my help, who the fuck am I to judge yeah. what they do, how they got to, I don't know this story, and nor do I want to know this story of how they got to where they got, unless it relates to me helping them. Mm. So I don't judge people, right? So it went from me stopping myself to stopping close people around me, to stopping friends of theirs, to, to suddenly just becoming, I don't even deal with phobias very often. Mm. I don't even want to do with phobias. So give me was, an example. Someone calls you up. Yep. We'll give the details after this. Someone calls you up. They've been serving up for years. Yep. They know they're going to get nicked very, very soon at some point. Or someone's got an addiction. He's a dad or a mum working a job. 
They know they've got this addiction. They need to get out of this. They're going to call you. What's the first thing you do? The first thing I do when I get once I've got them in. So someone is so like, they now become my client or they're on the phone. They're on the phone initially, okay. saying I'm so, on initial so the, call. How does it work? So listen, the first the first thing I ask. So you, so let's just say you are that person that wants help, and you call me up. Or normally, a lot of my people have come through social media. Yeah. I put out a video every single day on my TikTok, my Instagram, etc. Yeah. Right. So so, and to put it in perspective, right of how many users, okay, and we're not just talking UK, because obviously when you use TikTok and other social media, it, it goes across yeah. many countries. But I have an average of 5 million views a week. Mm. You know, just begin to think. In, in one year, I've had 70 million views, yeah. right? You know, on one subject, we're not talking about multiple subjects. On one, Purely the, cocaine. The only, every video I do is on one thing, cocaine addiction. That is it, nothing else, yeah. right? So everybody that tunes in is tuning just for that. 5 million a week just shows you how just huge it is. how rife it is in the country. Huge, huge, right? <laughs> So, so well, we use uh, 117 tons of cocaine in the UK every single year. 117 tons. It's just, you know, yeah. it's vast, right? Someone's earning a lot of money. Someone's <laughs> earning. I think they estimated in London alone it was something like a billion pounds a week a or week, something yeah. like that. It was yeah, just yeah. crazy. Yeah. So you phoned me up because you've got an addiction, right? Uh, and you may have seen my TikToks, maybe you've Googled me, whatever, you've been recommended to me, a lot of clients are recommended to me. And my first question is, how often do you use? So if the client says, I use twice a week, and I go, well, what quantity do you use twice a week? And they go, well, I use like two grams on a Friday and two grams on a Saturday, I use four grams a week. So then I explain how, how I work, and it's like, the first thing I do with a client is this, I do a case history session. So every session I do with a client is 45 minutes and my structure is usually four to five sessions is pretty average over a, over a four to five week span of time right but the most important session is the case history because I need to know their age their location um, who they live with any children they have their occupation the financial capacity who they use with the experiences they use with wow. whether they use a alcohol whether they they finish it all in one go, do they put it away? I'll ask them how. Let's say let's say they got a four a point four a P four right, and I'd say to them how many lines you get of a point four. And not many people have thought and they go well, I don't know. Well, if you can tell me how many lines you get of a point four, I can visualize that. I know how big a, a line you do, how far apart you do them. If you do them an average person is half an hour apart, whether you do them an hour apart, you do a whole gram in one line, you do a whole gram over three lines, mm -hmm. that starts to tell yeah. me multiple things. Yeah. And I think the flaw with so many things up to now, okay? And let me just give a caveat here because I think certain things work for certain people and I think certain things don't work for certain people, right? So I'm not anti any methodology of trying to stop using for any addict, right? That I'm not. But I think there's a lot of antiquated methods out there where they use a format and this is the same thing they do for each person. So hang on a minute, let's give you two extremes. I've got a guy who's 40 years old, been using for 20 years, and he uses every two weeks. But every two weeks, he starts on a Thursday night. And he does a Thursday night, a Friday night, a Saturday night, a Sunday night. He does a binge yeah. of four days. No sleep, right? And he drinks alcohol with that. And over that four days, he's done a 1,000 pounds, yeah. right? And probably a 1,000 pounds on hookers as well, right? But a 1,000 pounds, right? It's true. 1,000 pounds on a four-day binge. And he, he's not married, he's single, and he's got a good or, job. Or he is married. Yeah, or he, no, but we can use yeah, yeah, two yeah. different examples. Yeah, he's yeah. not married, and he's earning, like, say, 35 grand a year, right? And then I've got somebody else. Let's use a woman, right? I've got a woman who's, uh, let's say she's 30 years old. She's got three kids. Husband goes out the door. Uh, she starts using. She does a gram through the course of the day, tries and finishes off before the husband gets home, tries to level out, you know, take finding the money from there, from taking from the housekeeping and from other things mm -hmm. she's got. You know, they're two different people, right? Mm. You can't use the same cookie cutter mold to help both of those people at completely different extremes stop using. Mm. And I think the difference with what I do with the case history is I specifically tailor everything to my individual client. How can you go into a group? And I do think for certain people, having a group and discussing it is mm. great. But when you go, I'm not that, I'm not like that, mm. I'm not like that, I'm not like that. I just think that there's a slightly... Um, there's an Achilles heel with using a model that's replicating the same thing every time. Mm. And I think what I do, and, 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 I, and I'm fortunate to be in the private sector that I can do that, right? Because that's the other thing, you know, these, these things in the NHS or in the free system, they, can't, they don't have the time and the resource and the availability to do that. I tailor it to every single person. So whether that person uses it with their partner, and it's all about what I call the funky chicken, you know, mm. the funky chicken, getting it on, you know? Because yeah. there's, there's two addictions for a lot of people. One addiction is using the gear, using the packet, yeah. right? But if they use it with a partner or even without a partner when they're using, like they're watching, you know, 
that stuff. Yeah. Porn, right? <laughs> uh, they have an addiction to two things. Yeah. They have an addiction to using, and they have an addiction to using and the funky chicken, mm. right? So then that person's different to somebody else over here because I've got to address both of those mm. things. So, so everything has to be individualized. So the first thing I do with a client is a case history. I get to understand them, when they use, how they use, the frequency use, the quantity use, where they do it, do they alcohol, do they dry sniff, you know, what, how far apart, what time would they start, what mm -hmm. time do they finish, would they always finish everything they got, would they put it away, if they'd always finish everything they got, is that because they don't trust themselves the next day, how long is that pain and pleasure in their head, so I get to understand everything, Powerful. Right? Everything. That's powerful, El. Yeah, and then I spend like mm. three hours, and I'll take all that information, and I already have a, a, a format, but I'm now going to do, change my format but according to everything that they've then told me. So we're talking about maybe maybe a thousand different computations of me getting to them to where they need to be by all the different things that they've told me. So, so it has to be individualized. It has to be down to them. How confident are you, someone coming to you and you, and them actually stopping? Okay. So, so here's the weird thing, right? I'm not going to knock something, but I am going to tell you a true story that really grated on me a few months ago. I'm driving in my car, I'm driving home from the clinic, it's a Friday, I remember it very clearly. A guy phones me up, he said, um, somebody told me all about you, he says, all about your social media is really big and it's huge, and I was like, okay, thank you, how can I help you? Mm. He said, I'm a director of multiple rehabs, right? We have five rehabs in the UK alone, and we're wondering if you can help us. So I'm open to anything, right? Because I'm, I'm all about giving back in life, right? You know, I'm passionate about helping people. So I was expecting him to say, well, could you come in and give a talk at some of our rehabs? And I'd have gone, I'd love to do that, right? I was really open. He said, would you, rec would you, would you refer to us? And I said, well, what do you mean refer to? He said, well, how do you deal with the, the physical you know, withdrawal? And I said, what physical withdrawal? He said, you know, when people are throwing up. I said, well, well I don't deal with heroin. I don't deal with crack. Yeah. I don't deal with any other substance. I deal with cocaine and people sniffing cocaine. Yeah. That's my specific area of expertise, and that's where the realms I stay with it. He goes, well, they have a withdrawal. I said, there's no withdrawal. There is no physical withdrawal. Yes, there's psychological withdrawal, yeah. but you don't get somebody who stops using cocaine sitting there shivering like a heroin addict going, yeah. being sick. So, so why would I need to send you to a detox center? Mm. So the long and short of it was, he said, well, what about money? I said, well, what about money? He said, well, what about if we pay you money? And I said, well, my clients pay me money because I have to live. Of course, mm. I don't do it for free. I spent years studying. I still develop things. I, I spend time you know, giving back. So, of course, I get paid, obviously. He goes, what about money? He said, we will give you 50%. I was like, 50% of what? 50% of any client that comes through our rehab, we'll give you 50% of what they, they're charged. And that could be anywhere between five and 20,000 pounds and 30,000 pounds for this day. So you're going to give me between two and a half and 15 to 20 grand for every person I refer. Yeah. I said, why would I do that? He said, because, you know, that would help. I said, okay, answer me this question. What is your success rate? What is your percentage of success rate? And in my opinion, right, being someone who has studied a degree, a master's, a PhD in psychology, right, I, I like to have a, something you can pin your hat on. Give me your success rate. I'm not asking for five years because that's impossible. But you can track people for a 12-month period of time, right? Yeah. You can do a snippet trial of, let's say, 100 people, mm. 1,000 people. I just want to know, what is your success rate after 12 months? And his, was, his answer was telling. He said, I don't know. I said, well, how, why don't you know? He said, well, do you know? I said, of course I know. I know 87%. 87% based on 300 people, 12 months later, follow-up, were still clean. Whether they start after two years or three years, I can't say that, yeah. right? That's true. So you're, you're, what you're saying is you're getting 87%, 87 percent right? success rate. Success rate over a 12-month period yeah. of time. And the way I figure is if you've been clean for 12 months, you are so much more likely to stay clean yeah. than a month, right? So 12 months to me is a pretty fair period of time. He says, I don't know. I said, why don't you know? He said, because when they walk out the door, we don't have anything else to do with them. I said, you don't have anything else to do with them? Um, he said no and he said if, and then he said without me saying anything but if they don't succeed they were there for the wrong reasons or maybe their parents pay for them or the family pay for them or they were just there for the wrong reason they didn't succeed mm. and I said well you don't sound like you really care yeah. he said well once we walk out the door they're not really our problem and I went not That's in a magic. billion yeah. years do I want to maybe it was just his rehab centers yeah. or I can't speak for every rehab center mm. but it has a conversation with someone who's a director of five rehab clinics in the UK mm. and I'm like listen I, here's the honest truth right if a client comes to me and we've had we've had this discussion on the phone and I've put them in and they've got through these 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 hoops because I don't just take anybody right and here's the truth 
and they come in and the first 10 minutes I don't think I'm right for them because I am a straight talker mm. or I don't feel they're right for me I will turn around I will shake their hands I go listen you paid a deposit to be here today I'm going to refund your deposit yeah. it's back in your account I'm going to shake hands with you but I'm not for you and they look yeah. at me and go what, 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 you're not going to treat me no you're not ready you're not ready yeah. I'm not right for you this program isn't right for you you're not the right sort of person you know if you sit here going to me no, I haven't got a problem. No, I haven't got a problem. No, I've got. Even though they've parted with the money to be there, right? I haven't got a problem. I haven't got a problem. I haven't got a problem. I'm like, you know what? Come back when you think yeah. you have. Yeah. Or, or, or listen. Here's a here's a here's an interesting one. I have a kid who's I say kid because I'm 53 and my son's 24, right? <laughs> but I have a, a young lad. He's 23 years old. Came to see me, and uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you the whole story. His father's a very very wealthy guy in the music industry, very wealthy. And this, this young lad had a privileged background. And I don't, uh, when I say that, and people go, oh, you shouldn't be get a silver spoon. I'm like, I'm all about giving a silver spoon. Mm. So I have no issue with him having a privileged lifestyle because that's what I want to give my children. Mm. And that's what my children I want to be able to give their children because to me, that's what life's that's, about. Hold that thought a minute. Yep. That's really nice to hear. Okay. Because the reason why I say that is because everyone's relates to silver spoon. Oh, your mummy and daddy giving you money. If I'm working my plums off to get as much money as possible so I can give my son the best. 100%. But he's growing up. He ain't going to have silver spoon because he's going to have respect and discipline. Oh, he's got all of the stuff that goes with it. Yeah. But that's a privilege. That's happy days. I've given him a little booster. Listen, if my son and daughter, yeah. right, sat yeah. in bed all day till four o'clock in the afternoon, I would be on their case like a ton of bricks, yeah, same, right? Same. But they get up and they graft. You know, my daughter did a degree in law and master's in law. My yeah. son's an electrician. He's an electrical lecturer. You know, I'm, I'm proud, right, yeah. that they go to work and do what they do. And I'm going to give them whatever I can in life to give them the fastest head start. You call that a silver spoon. I call that common sense. Yeah. Simple. I could totally agree. So I get this, this young lad. He's had a silver spoon in a great way. I think it's great. He went to a privileged school school, £100,000 a year, he wants to go in the same industry as his dad. I said his dad's a musician, very famous in the UK, right? And I think to myself, that's a big footsteps to follow. Yeah, You're course. never going to follow course. in your dad because your dad's made it. Yeah. And it's hard to make. And yeah. to, to do that in two generations is a rarity, right? Unless there's nepotism thrown in. That's true, Always right? But there isn't with yeah. this. Yeah, there okay. is, seriously isn't. So his son cannot get a job in the same industry as his mm. dad, right? So his dad's giving him £2,000 a week allowance. Dad buys him for his 18th birthday a brand Porsche 911. Beautiful car, mm. right? Dad buys him a three-bedroom house in Hampstead Heath in North London. We're talking millions mm. of pounds, mm. right? And um, <clears throat> he's been to rehab three times, unsuccessful. And, and he comes home and his dad phones me up. He says, listen, you've been recommended to me because uh, I saw three people in the Premiership Football Club and he must know them somehow. And he said, such and such mm. saw you. And I was like, I was surprised. I obviously didn't say that this person came to see me for what they saw me for because I tried to, to say, oh yeah, it's for anxiety. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. Because if you've got somebody out there in, in the public domain, Keep your stum. even if they, even if they're recommending to me, the <clears> last <throat> thing I'm going to do is turn around and say what they came to see me for because yeah. everything seems to me is confidential. You know, I'm not going to suddenly say, oh, that surgeon is a pediatric surgeon operating on young children the next day, saw me last night. You know, I'm not going to, that's not my yeah, place. Yeah. Or, you know, that guy who's, on, who's playing for England, I saw him about a month ago. Yeah. You can't do that, yeah. right? So he comes to see me, uh, and I said, listen, you, well, the only thing you've got to do with me is be completely and 100% honest. Do you want to be here? He said, um, I do want to be here. I said, no, no, no. The way you use the tone of voice, you don't want to be here, I'm going to shake your hand and say good night, goodbye. Been there 10 minutes. Mm. So now I'm pushing him out the door, not physically, but mm. I'm, I'm getting him out the door, uh, and he's like, no, 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 no. I'm like, no, 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 we're done, right? We're done. He's like... No, but I do want to be here. I said, no, no, your dad wants you to be here, right? So if your dad wants you to be here and you don't want to be here, you're wrong for wrong reasons. And I'm not here to take somebody's money and waste my time because I've got plenty of money. Well, not plenty, but you know, I make yeah. a good living. I don't need that kind of money. But the one thing I'm short on in life is time, mm. right? We can't, that's the, that's the thing as it's you get older. Got, it? yeah. It's the only thing you've got. Yeah, and as you yeah. get older, you've got less of goes it, right? Yeah, it goes Someone quicker. said to me the other day, some old boy, about eight years, I love older people because they're probably wise. He said, as you get older, it's like having a bog roll. The end bit of the bog roll, you pull it and just go, and yeah. then you're gone. That's yeah. <laughs> a great analogy. Great it analogy. is, but I'm hoping I've got a bit, bit longer bog roll. <laughs> I need a lot of bog roll. Uh, I eat a lot. Um, anyway, so, so, so in the end, you know, he was desperate. And I could hear in his voice, he was convincing me as he was walking out the door. I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you this one opportunity. Come back in. So he comes back in, we do this full case history. He's using 4.4s a day. He's using, Hold on, he's using 4.4s a day. Yeah, so okay. 1.6 a day. Okay. 1.6, because some people buy them in yeah. fours or three yeah. for 100, great yeah. deals, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, 
you know, they're, they're like influencers, three for a hundred, and like, yeah, I'll get three, okay. right? Uh, they come through on WhatsApp, didn't they? Like three for a hundred and all the... I gotta tell you, Dodge, it yeah. took two years after I stopped using for all the texts to stop coming through. Yeah. Two years, yeah. kept getting them. Anyway. What, people passing your number around it? No, people, people, people ask, knowing, that, knowing that I use, yeah, going, yeah. oh, I can get you banging deals, I've got yeah. the best flake in the world, I've got quality gear, I've got a oh, great from <laughs> Columbia. I'm like, fuck me. Leave me alone. Yeah, two years, <laughs> yeah, two years. Wow. Block the number, comes to another number. Yeah. Just ridiculous. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so he's using 1.6 a day and he's using a little bit of ketamine to go to sleep at the end of the evening and a few brandies. So I said, listen, if we're going to do this, we're going to do this, right? And he starts telling me all about his life and about he doesn't, doesn't he's not going to get into this the same area as his dad it's what he's wanted to do and he's given me all of this um how he's had a hard life and you know here's the thing right just a kid who's got a silver spoon yes right, okay but you know what it's interesting because mm. we can't judge right mm. because one's perception of a hard life is different to just, somebody yeah. else's perception of a hard yep. life right just because someone hasn't been battered and bruised doesn't mean that they're not psychologically upset or damaged through seeing somebody mass successful yeah. and them unsuccessful yeah. and thinking, why don't I have that talent? Yeah. Why am I not that good enough? That must be an awful feeling. Right. So, so you see where seeing I'm Seeing your old from. man like right. being there and you You're, can't get anywhere and we're near. Talking about, yeah. We're talking about super successful, yeah. right? Yeah. So, and then you want to do the same thing. And it's like, am I not good enough? Am I not, am I not worthy? Yeah. So, so there's a different trauma aspect, if you like the word mm. trauma, mm. from that. So I'm not there to judge. I so say just because he hasn't been battered and bruised, mm. he's still been psychologically affected. Mm. Anyway, so I said, okay, but you've got to be completely honest with me. So my first, so that's the case history, comes back next session. My goal at that first session is always get a 50% reduction. Because I, I like to use the analogy of an alcoholic, right? If someone's an alcoholic and they use a bottle of vodka a day, doesn't it make more sense to get into half a bottle and then a quarter yeah. bottle before you start well, drinking? Wean them off, wean them off. Exactly, yeah, okay. so I'm using the same principle. But instead of most people who use uh, the packet, right, they think of reducing the quantity. So let's say... Uh, four tickets, 1.6. Most people would go, well, I'll try and use two tickets the next day, two tickets the next day. No. I prefer keep to your four, then a day off. Keep to your four, then a day off. So I'm still getting a 50% reduction. So you're getting them to just reduce the amount. Right. Of, okay. But, but not, Over time. But I'm not getting them to reduce the, the quantity per usage. Yeah, I'm getting the day days. in between, yeah, okay, right? Okay. And there's a reason I'm doing that. The first reason is I'm all about psychology. I want to have a day when they're clean. A day when they're not, a day when they're clean. And then they start remembering that I can get through 24 hours being yeah. clean. Then I have certain hooks in the brain that I can take and I can use the resource of the day they had clean and how they felt about it, and I can feed that back to them in a loop in their head yeah. to make them want to do it more and more. Yeah. So the first step is a 50% reduction, and I do that across the board, right? 50% reduction if, if they're a daily user, mm -hmm. right? He comes back to see me. And he says, yeah, I'm doing really, really well. I used some hypnosis. I used some psychology on him. I had his eyes closed. I had him changing his mindset. I used all the resources from the case history I took. Now I said to him, you can just use on a Friday or a Saturday night. You can choose. He comes back the next session. He said, I haven't touched it at all. I said, what, not even on a Friday or Saturday? He says, no. I was like, okay. All right, carry on, and I'll see him next week. Now, at this point, I'm now gone from stopping him because there are different steps in this to preventing him using again, right? So he's stopped, but I don't want him to relapse. And yeah. now I'm making sure he does not start again. That's, so my structure's changed. Uh, just before he's about to come back to see me, his mum phones me and I said, listen, and this is very true. I said, listen, whatever you're about to tell me, I cannot comment on my client. Even though you're paying the mm. bill, I can't comment. But if you tell me something that you think I should hear, I will listen, but I'm gonna tell my client, you told me, and if you're cool with that, then tell me. So okay. she says, listen, we're really happy. Uh, we've never seen anything like that. He came out of rehab, and when he got the train home, he was using the moment he got home, which is a bit like a holiday. You go away, you don't use, you come back, the moment you get well, like back. Well, if you went to the Priory or something, right. is so, that what you're so, saying? So what I'm saying, he went to the Priory yeah, actually. Okay. So what I'm saying is this, right? Big money to go in there. 52,000, I think the parents spent on the first three weeks of been being there, something around Jesus. that time. Yeah, a lot of money, right? But imagine going to a country where it's not accessible, right? And we go there for three weeks. Mm. Most people, 90% of users in that three weeks won't even think about using it. They're there with the family, they're having a good time, yeah. they're going on tours, they, do it, they don't think about it. But the moment they're on the plane, it's like, oh, yeah. I've landed. Then, I've landed. Yeah. Hello, mate. The luggage going around the carousel. I'll be home in half an hour. Yeah. Can you drop one off for me? That's what they're doing, right? Yeah. So it's the same principle. Mm. They're away from their environment when they're in rehab. So of course they don't use. They go, oh, I didn't use for three weeks. Yeah, mm. but you went home for three weeks, mm. right? Anyway, he'd been through three different rehabs and the moment he got home or the next day or maybe a week later, he'd used again. 
So he comes back to see me. Uh, so she says, listen, we're really happy. Um, he, you stopped him all week, better than he's ever had, right? But he's still using it on a Friday night. I said, I said, how do you know? She said, because he doesn't answer the phone, classic signs, and he won't answer the door on the next Saturday. I was like, okay, I can't discuss it with you. He comes in, I said, you're a wanker. I looked right at my client. I said, you're a wanker. He's like, what, what? I said, you're a wanker. He said, well, you can't say that. I said, I'm saying it and you are. And I'm going to tell you why you're a wanker. Your mum phoned me and she said, we still believe he's, using a, he's done really well, but he's still using it on a Friday night. And I said, how do you know he's still using it on a Friday night? She said, because he doesn't answer his phone, doesn't answer the door, classic signs. I was like, okay. And I said, let me tell you something, you're a wanker. You're not a wanker because you're still using it on a Friday night. You're a wanker because you told me you didn't and I believe your mum. Yeah. He looks at me and he's like, Oh, headlights and yeah. he goes yeah I am still using the front I said that's why you're a wanker you're yeah. not a wanker because if you'd have come back and go I'm still doing this mm. I'd have gone right I've dealt with that I've dealt mm. with that I've dealt with this I haven't dealt with that right I've got to deal with that mm. so and that's what I said it's, it's very fluid I'm working with my clients on an individual mm. basis because you can't predict what's going to happen in their life during that course of their stopping can you predict what's going to happen in someone's life if they're using more and more because we've all got friends who use do you find out the friends that use who are boozing and then use cocaine tell lies oh, of course I don't know a single person with addiction that doesn't tell a lie. But And let me expand on that, yeah. right? You either lie to your friends of your quantity you use. Oh, my gosh. They That's lie the to one, their partner yeah. for sure. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people who go home, sit there at night, go up in the toilet, what I call the toilet hidden flush. Flush the toilet, do a line. <laughs> flush in the toilet, go downstairs, sit there, watch an EastEnders, pretend they haven't done it. Then they get to bed at night and they're lying there. And they can't sleep for shit and their, their partner's asleep and they're trying to lie, they pretend they've got their eyes closed. So they're lying to their partner. Yeah. <clears throat> they're lying to their friends. But most of all, they're lying to themselves. Yeah. They're trying to convince themselves. You know, becoming a user is all about lie, 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 lie. Until one day, if you wake up, you realize where you are. And it can take some people a long time. And, you know, with my social media, especially my TikTok, right? Because my TikTok, I get... A, the thing about TikTok for me is, I think a lot of people anonymity is hidden yeah. so their user number two seven three four five mm. six seven two so they can write whatever they want mm. and our people go oh, i don't think it's a problem i'm only using it for, i'm not going to become an, an addict and i said so hang on a minute do you think there's a single person who has an addiction now who when they very started at the very beginning thought i oh, know one day i'm going to become an addict i'm going to become addicted mm. to this substance i'm going to use cocaine only on a friday only once a month but one day i'm going to end up using it three four five six mm. seven times a week of course they didn't no single person with an addiction thought at some point they would end up where they are now. That's a fact, right? So I said, you know, so where was I? How do you know, <laughs> yep. any listeners out there, how do you know if you are an addict? Okay. So I, I would define the word addiction as this. Somebody who has a craving to a substance or a behavior that has a temporary relief from a feeling of pain or discomfort that you can't give up that has a negative consequence. That to me in a nutshell is how I would describe an addiction. An addiction is somebody has a craving or a substance that seems to give a temporary relief. Maybe it's an escapism from their life. Yeah. Maybe it's an escapism for, maybe it's self-medicating, maybe getting away from the humdrum of life, the stress of work, whatever it may be, successful people, unsuccessful people, that I'm not successful, that I'm too successful, that I've got too much stress. Mm. That has a negative consequence. That to me is an addiction. And I think eventually for the majority of users, people get there. And whether they get there within, because I did a survey, I, I put out this, and it had uh, a million views. So, And it had around about 35,000 comments. It's a pretty fair mm. response, mm. right? And I put at what age, uh, how long after using did it reach a point where it was out of control? And I kind so you, of- So you put a comment- at what age? No, I put two, two different things. Yeah. So, a what age did you first start using? Yeah. And I'll answer that in a yeah. minute. And the second one I put, how long after using did you realize that it got out of control? Wow. I'd and love I, to know what that second one is. The, the out of control? Yeah, just right. like the amount of years till okay. they realize so, it's got out of control. So I had a real expectation because I looked at myself and I was thinking, okay, for myself, how many years did it seem like it was just an occasional thing to a point where it became a... It's such a regular thing. And for me, I think it was around about four and a half, five years. And I was thinking, and I've seen thousands of clients. And just for you? Just for me, four okay. and a half okay. years, I think, for me personally, okay. right? So, so I was expecting anything from two years 
to 20 years because yeah. I've had people who used it 10 years and all of a sudden it's got out of control. They didn't have it out of control for the first 10 years. All of a sudden they've been using it for 10 years. Some, some th certain things mm. happen in their life, right? And now it's got out of control. So when I did this survey, I had people say within two months. Some people said within a week of using because it could be at that moment in time in their life when it suddenly made them feel good yeah. to not worry about problems or, or maybe they're the sort of person. I had a 25-year-old the other day and he says to me, but L, what am I going to do when I go out socializing? Because I, I don't feel comfortable talking to girls, but I can go on the Twitter, do a couple of sneaky lines, and I'm like, I'm like the life and soul of the pie. I'm there talking mm. to anybody. So you have to kind of go, okay, so what do I need to deal with this guy? I'm not just dealing with his addiction. I've actually got to deal with his own self-confidence yeah. to be able to speak publicly, comfortably, confidently to girls, because otherwise he's going to go back to it. So I'm not just dealing with his addiction. I'm dealing with his self-esteem and self-confidence. His mindset. If, and his mindset. Yeah, of so Because I've got to address that, yeah. right? And that's why it goes back to what the very beginning I said. How can you do a cookie-cutter mold yeah. that you go in that's based on the same thing for all these same people? Because this guy is completely out of mm. the ballpark. Because if you don't deal with his self-confidence in social situations, he's going to go back to the one thing that he relies on mm. to make him feel good. When did you know? When did you know <laughs> when you were when you were uh, using all the time the difference between getting pub grub and really good cocaine pure? And obviously in our country, it's not really pure cocaine. But it's you know what? Three or four times. I, I'm going to say this, right? Because I have been shot down by so many times on social media. And I don't just pull a statistic out of my head and go, oh, it's this, right? So what I did is I looked at the National Statistics Office. I got police records. I went to the, to the drug testing where they test uh, what has been um, seized, yeah. right? And in the seizure report, um, they measured cocaine between an ounce and kilo. So we're not talking about someone who's just been yeah. caught with a ticket or a gram. Mm. We're talking about minimum of an ounce right through to massive kilos, right? And it went from 10% proof to a maximum of 40% proof, right? So 40% proof in the key that's been brought over. 40% proof in the key. Wow. Right, in the key, wow. right? And then people go, no, I'll get 90%, I'll get 100%, mate. I'll get 100% gears, baggy fucking gear, mate. 100%, I'm like, you don't get 100%. No, I'll get 100%, because they're convinced, yeah, right? They're convinced, yeah. right? I'm yeah. like, well, have you ever washed it up? What's that? Well, how do you know? Have yeah. you ever tested it? No, well, of course not. Who told you that? My dealer told me. <laughs> Sorry, hang on a minute. Uh, dealer, um, were you going to say that this is the shittest coke I've ever had? <laughs> yes, you've got to come and buy some. In fact, buy three extra because it's so shit. I said, he's your salesman. What do you think he's going to do? <laughs> yeah. He's going to say, he's banging, mate. The best yeah. I've ever got in. Yeah. It's fucking shit. Yeah. <laughs> listen, as so you go in a pub, you're looking at 10% to maybe 40%. And listen, maybe in 2023 when, when things have changed, like you might be fortunate enough to get 50%. So I, I've, done all, I've done all sorts, right? I've done your shit 10% and I've done your... 40, 50%. I've mm. done that, you know, but listen, I've been around a lot of people in my life and I've got a lot of friends serving, you know, big stretches for dealing with 5.6 million, 6 million pounds of cocaine. So I've had people give me what is good and I've had people give me what is shit. It's mm. as simple as that, mm. you know, but I think, I think what people don't realize is this is, is the price you're paying now, right? Is the same price you were paying 10 years ago. Hang on a minute. Something's got a shift in your brain. Mm. Surely the dealer's making money, the importer's making money, and therefore the quality of what you're going to get is becoming less and less. Mm. It's going to be stamped all over it, right? Um, stamped on more than a Nike swoosh. Mm. That's what they say. Mm. You know, so they press it, and people are like, no, no, it's got a sparkle like that. I said, yeah, they put magic on it. It's a certain powder, gives it a sheen, it makes it look like flake. I said, you know, you ain't getting flake, it's press, mm. right? No, 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 what I get is good. No, it's not, it's shit, right? And, and, and what they use is additives, they use Novocaine, Benzocaine, is what they used to use a lot. The problem is Novocaine and Benzocaine, they used to be able to get from dentists quite easily or tattoo parlors. Now the regulation is so stringent, they still get it, don't misunderstand yeah. me but it becomes more expensive by the barrel. So if that price has doubled, and yet what you're buying is the same price, right? You have to cut it with other things in order to make a profit because mm. no dealer's doing it out of love. They're doing it out of money. That's the bottom line, mm. right? Or to pay for their own habit, not out of love. So they use Benzocaine, Novocaine, they use Sucrose, they use Pro Plus, they use Ephedrine. You know, they use all of these things that they put in there and now, they use rat poison because rat poison gives you a bit of a buzz, right? And you can buy it from any of your or, or any of your um, Home Depot stores. Very easy to get, very cheap. 
and it has strychnine. Strychnine is a rat poison, and that's why when people start using over prolonged use, and they get that, uh, 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 they can't get their words out. Yeah. You ever seen somebody on yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And they're like, they can't, they can't think speak. straight. They yeah. can't speak. Yeah, they can't speak because the strychnine is affecting the is neurotransmitters. That that's exactly what it is. And people go, no, 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 no. They I'm normally like, go, oh, this is powerful. That's why I can't speak. It's like, exactly. Man, they it's put a rat it, poison. Of course it is. They want to put it down to the fact that what they're getting is banging, mate. Banging, it's banging. Yeah. You want to try this, right? It's rubbish. What they're putting in here, what they're being cut with. They're like, no, no, it's pure. It's pure. You know, and I'm just like, listen, those are the reports. Go online. You can find the police reports yourself as seizures. You can look mm. at the percentage rates. Uh, and that's exactly what it is. Mm. You know, it doesn't take, you know, a mathematician to work out that it's less quality now. Simple. What you're doing here, there's also an alternative as well with Cocaine Anonymous, CA. Yes, yeah. What are your thoughts on CA? Listen, okay, I, I, I'm going to say this about every single thing. I'm not against anything, and I think certain things work for certain people, but I am here to pull out some flaws perhaps so when we think about ca it was written in the 1950s so not many people realize that so it was written by a guy who was an alcoholic for alcoholics so for aa i think it's a really good format so let me get that clear anybody who's thinking about aa i think it's a very good format if it fits comfortably with you because with aa there's a lot less triggers yes there are triggers like cocaine but there's less instead of maybe a thousand combination there's probably 700 combination so i think if it works for you it's good right i think if anything works for you it's good so it was developed for alcoholics, right, in the 1950s. 1950s, 2023, right? 1950s, no mobiles, no internet, no cars, no, you know, no, no pizza delivery. Mm. You know, it wasn't like, you know, the Albanians had taken over mm. like they have today. Mm. You know, it, it was very, very different, right? It's very, very different. So then you go to this group, right, and you follow this format, which is quite spiritual religious. And if that fits with you, I think if you find God or if you find any other form, I think that's great. But everybody's sitting in this sharing. I want to share with you this today. Yeah, okay. But I'm not like him. I'm not like him. And how is your having a prayer and having your discussion in your meeting going to help the person that whose dad is successful in the music business and he's feeling like he's absolutely worthless? How is that format going to fit the guy who can't talk to girls? How is that format going to fit the woman who whose husband goes to work and she's getting on it doing the housework? How is that going to fit the woman that runs a charity organization that I have that does two grams a day, starts at 11 o'clock in the morning, finishes at five, has two double vodkas before she drives home to level herself out, goes home and uses the other gram, and who's very successful mm. in the charity world, CEO, right? How is it going to help my, my celebrities on TV? You can't use the same format. You've got a 1,000 people walk through your door. Don't tell me that that 1,000 people are all exactly the mm. same. The one person who sits on the chair watching Netflix or the other person who's playing PlayStation all night the other person who's sitting there chatting with his mates. Mm. You've got to deal with them differently. So the two different ones of what you've got here seems to be a great business model that you've got. I also look at CA and think that's a great business model. Well, it's not even a business model because it's free. It that's is the first free. It's free. Well, and, and, and hear me out. Yep. And also, it's free. You can go to a meet in a day. Yes, you can. You can meet like-minded people. And get numbers. You can get mentors. Yep. And you can get numbers, like you say. But also, I think the big thing for me here is it all goes deeper and deeper to find out what trauma you had as a kid to break through that trauma by doing the 12-step program. Yep. Clearing that trauma up to hopefully stop you drinking, or stop you eating, stop okay. you having sex, stop you doing cocaine, stop you gambling. Okay. The problem is that's if you can find the 12 steps to follow yourself. But if you're not of the right mindset to find your trauma, how are you going to resolve it? Because you're not sharing that in a meeting. You're just in a meeting. Mm. Sometimes you need to go into a complete understanding of how that trauma affected you, where it came from, why it's still affecting you. Is that tr does that trauma have a basis? What else is it affecting you? How else is it affecting you? And in a meeting where you're sharing with a group where not one single person is a psychotherapist or psychologist, mm. there's no methodology to get to the root. Mm. So, listen. But you do you do have a sponsor. You do have a sponsor. And your sponsor has been there, got the T-shirt, well, and is now clean. It, it, your sponsor is somebody who had their own journey, yep. whose journey could be very, very different from yours, right? Who has got clean per se, not necessarily. Mm. Do you know how many sponsors I have seen that come and see me because they're not clean, yeah. but they can't not say that? How many people will I put a, a, a video? But do you not think it's good having a sponsor that you're about to go and use on a Friday night? 100%. You're texting your sponsor, I'm about to use, I'm clucking, I want to use, and they go, what are you doing? Stop, just get through Friday night and wake up tomorrow so it's another day. That's true. They, with, with someone like yourself, who have they got? That's true. Yeah. That's very true. That's very true. Well, I said you should go and watch some more of my videos because they're going to give you more In information. Yeah, and yeah, they're yeah. free. Yeah. You know, we can remember, I've got 500 videos up there 
uh, that are completely I think, free I, to l- watch. L- listen, L, I think it's magic what you're doing. I really do. And I think the business model is amazing. If someone's listening right now out there who is stuck in a rut, yep. is using, looking around, nowhere to turn to, off cheating behind the missus back, off using in the daytime, they're working up in the city, sniffing in the daytime, and realise they've got a problem. What's the steps you would advise them to take if they wanted to contact you? If they want to contact me, just go onto my website, www.hypnosis-expert.com. Get in touch. Google my name, Elliot Ward, spelled W-A-L-D, not R-D. Mm. Get it all the time. And get in touch, and we'll have a chat, and we'll have a conversation. I'll think and see if it's right for you. Mm. You know, my peer will answer your call. I'll get around to messaging you. Uh, here's the thing. A lot of people start watching my videos when they're absolutely wired at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I find this really interesting. Before the funky chicken. Yeah, before, (laughs) maybe after the funky chicken, when they're lying there and they're sort of coming down a bit. And I think to myself, hang on a minute, you're watching a video about stopping using while you're using. How much fun could your using have been if you're watching a video to stop stop using and using? Mm. Let me just say this one thing, Dodge, because I think this is really, really important Mm. to get across. Human nature is about avoiding pain and seeking pleasure, right? We want to avoid pain and seek pleasure. If you put your hand in a red hot oven ring, you burn yourself, that's pain. You go, oh, I'm not going to do that. Mm. You're going to avoid it. But most things in life, there's an element of pain. We go to work, we call that pain to get paid, to buy nice things, we call that pleasure. We learn to drive a car, we call that pain, to have the freedom to get from A to B, we call that pleasure. That's how life Mm. works. Pain, pleasure. However, with addiction, and certainly with cocaine addiction, there is a perception of pleasure first, and the pain comes later. Mm. The biggest rush of using is the thought that it's going to be fun and different. And even when you've been in the pain and you think to yourself, oh, you forget all about it. Yeah. Even at two, three, four in the morning, you're like, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to use. Why did I do that? Why did I do that? And you believe it. And then that 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 mind, that memory, inside of your brain, something called deletion. It deletes and it deletes and it deletes. And yeah. It becomes smaller and smaller until you forget all about it. And by the time you get to two days or three days or four days or five days or a week in some cases, you completely forgot about the pain you're in. Yeah. And all you're doing is looking for the pleasure. Yeah. It's, like, it's like a mosquito bite. You know you shouldn't scratch it. Yeah. And... You know, whatever you do, you shouldn't scratch, because if you scratch, it's going to release the poison. But it's there, it's itching, and you're dying to scratch it. You keep trying to think about scratching, but you try and avoid it. Until you can no longer consciously focus on it, and you fall asleep. And in your sleep, you scratch it, and then it's like, oh, no, the poison's come out, and you want some more. And that's what it's like. It's very much like that fact. It's like, I know I shouldn't do it. Listen, there aren't many people who get to that point where they have an addiction who go, oh, I think it's really good. Yeah, they do beforehand, but not after. Yeah. They realize that they have a problem, mm. big time. And we're talking about people who earn and spend all their money every single week. I have clients of mine that, that spend the money and it's nothing to them. And I have clients of mine that are in tick to the tune of a thousand, two thousand to their dealers. Yeah. I have a, a, a guy of mine who used to unload lorries for a living, uh, work nights. He was earning like 150 pound a night doing this job, manual labor, grafting, good on him, right? Mm. He was spending a hundred pounds a night mm. using to do to his job, job to yeah. get through the job. Yeah. So at the end of the week, his hundred and fifty pound a day, and then you got tax on top of that, mm. right? Is five hundred of that plus the weekend seven hundred of his wages mm. were going on his deal, and he was left with like a hundred and fifty, two hundred quid. Mm. So you go to work to what? To make your mm. dealer rich? Mm. For what? That's that's when it's a problem, right? Yeah. But it's a problem when it affects your life because you're not present. You're with your family. And you're there, but you're not present. You're there, but you're not really there. And the most common word I hear with clients of mine, or people, you know, it's not just about my own clients because you're right there. You're not present. You're not you're present. You're constantly thinking of course about you where are. you can score, what you can do, how you can get rid of the family, getting out of the house to go and party oh, with the boys. Oh, definitely. And even yeah. when you are there, you're not there. Yeah. Even if you're using secretly upstairs, yeah. your mind's somewhere else. You're not there. You're not present. You've got a serious problem if you're using secretly in your own house. Do you know how common that is? That's very common. Very common. People, people sit there and they go, yeah, watching Netflix, so I put a movie on. And they're not. They're, they're inside their yeah. head somewhere else thinking about a billion other things, yeah. but they just can't escape from where they want What's to be. What's the root with cocaine, do you find? Do you find like the, from boozing to weed to ease to cocaine? Or take the ease out of the equation now of the world we're in where cocaine's rife. Cocaine is rife. Rife. I go to festivals. I own a festival. Yes. I'm not saying it's a, a, a drug fuel festival. It's not at all. But I go to festivals all around the UK. I see it everywhere. Yeah. See it everywhere. Everyone. I see eighteen-year-olds in um, the corner in front of the main stage. It's like it's Listen, forgiven. I, I, it, it, so it's, it's like be- it's a given. Yeah. Sorry, it's become it. it's become so commonplace. Do you know what I, annoys me about this whole thing is that the government are now stopping drug testing at festivals. 
Really? Yeah. And, and as festivals, drugs at festivals, that's what goes hand in hand. Booze and drugs at festivals. Why are we not going in there and testing it for people, letting them know what they're taking? It's funny the you government say no. I, I only read about three days ago a report that the Scottish Parliament wanted to decriminalise um, sub being caught with personal possession. Mm. Personal possession. They want to decriminalise it and therefore use that money to test for people to be able to walk in and test the substance. Yeah. And the reason they can't is because the British Home Office have said, we will never decriminalise, we will never decriminalise drugs in the United Kingdom, and they are controlled by the UK Home Office. Yeah. So, so do you think that they should decriminalise personal possession? What do you think? It's interesting. Because mm. it, it, I'm a bit tired, because I think, would that make more people use, or would it make more people seek treatment because they can be honest and open? I don't know. I don't know, I don't know either. Anymore. And it's interesting your point a minute ago. You said the buzz is going scoring. Yeah. That's part of the buzz. If, they, if the buzz wasn't there, I wonder if people go, oh, I don't need that buzz anymore to go and score. Because that's the fun, phoning up, chasing, did it, that's someone the else. That's the, the bit. biggest like, adrenaline rush and the butterfly feeling is, yeah. like, is going to pick it up. And once yeah. you've got it in your hand, three lines in, it's all downhill yeah. is what I say. Yeah. All downhill. Yeah. It seemed like a good idea. Yeah. Elliot, I've really enjoyed this My conversation. Pleasure. Really enjoyed it. I think you've explained it in a really, really easy way for people to understand. I, I think I just, I just want to say one thing, you know, because we talk about coming to see me and it's lovely and you know, I want to see clients and I help people. But as I say, I've got 500 videos on my social media, yeah. every single one on Cocaine Addiction. And I get every single week hundreds of people go, your videos have helped stop me using. And yeah. I've never met these person. They just watch my video. Yeah. And I'm like, listen, if my free stuff help you, Happy days. wow, I love that. I love that. Mate, that's wicked, man. You've certainly lived an eventful life, Al. I certainly have. Yeah, mate. You're a gentleman. <laughs> Pleasure, Dodge. Good man. Thank you. Nice one. <laughs>